one, just welcome on the internet tonight. May God bless hey. each one of you. Turn the service over to Brother Jackson. Hey. Thank you, Brother Allen. You may be seated tonight. Want to greet everybody? Appreciate everybody that's here tonight. May God bless you for being here. Now, if you have your Bibles tonight, turn with me back again into Matthew 24 and 25th chapter. You might say, well, you keep repeating yourself, Brother Jackson. I'm not doing it because I don't have nothing else to say. I am doing it to make each verse clear and understood. I'm sure if we was to print this article in the container and put it out, it won't be six months, I'll get a letter. Please, Brother Jackson, would you explain to this, this to me? What did you mean here? About six months ago, I got a letter. It was all in regards to a contender that we published on the 70 weeks of Daniel. This young man lives in Africa. He said, Brother Jackson, he says, the way I figure it, he said, from the time the 70 weeks started to where B.C. ended and A.D. begins, I get more days than you do. Well, you know where it's at? He thinks that B.C. ends where A.D. Be began. It don't. And there's probably some of you in here sitting in here thinks that. It does not. But any history that's written and is referred to by most of your historians today, B.C., the calendar time of B.C. ended with the death of King Herod. But keep in mind, the Roman calendar time that was written by the Roman Catholic Church had been corrected at least two or three times. And they started with the advent of Christ, the birth of Christ. And you know that Christ was born at least two years and so many days before the death of King Herod. Because where was Jesus at when King Herod died? He was in Egypt. Wasn't he? So if he would have looked and studied the chart that we put in the contender carefully, he would have never had to ask the question like that. B.C. ends with the death of King Herod. A.D. begins with the birth of Christ. And they overlap each other. And that's what most people can't understand. Well, why? Well, that's just the way historians are. There's a lot of them writing things today I can say why. They need to be shot. Because they, they rewrote it to the point to take the truth out and put their bunch of junk in. Now we're in the foolish virgins. Now I want you to put your finger right on verse 28 of the 24th chapter. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. That's a figure of speech. Jesus is not actually saying that his people are going to become a bunch of cannibals. It's a symbolic language. That when the time comes for these last day signs and things to come in place and that there is to be a people that's to have their eyes open and their hearts in tune with the coming of Christ. God is going to see to it that something is brought forth in the earth at large to cause them people to begin to seek for that truth. I have a reason for saying in this manner. <clears throat> That's why I go back to 19 and 63. While all the rest of denominationalism was going down their merry-making way, 
There was a little man that lived in this area. There's been a lot of impersonators of this man. Supposed to be the spirit of Elijah. But they were not. When that man was dealt with by God. To come back here and preach the revelation of those seals. That was the first time since the advent of the early church in 96 AD. The church angel messenger Paul to that age was dead. Had been for 30 years. He was beheaded in 66 AD. But John the last one. He's an old man. He was not the star to that age. Neither was he the messenger to that age. But he could have told you the story from start to begin to end. And when they isolated him on the Isle of Patmos, they thought they were going to shut him up. You can't shut God up. You can't lock a man up in prison and expect that God won't speak to him. And God showed him everything that you and I read in the book of Revelation. And there's things in here Paul never even saw in his hour. So brothers and sisters, keep in mind, verse 28 belongs to our day and time. It started right back there. You've got to have a hunger in your heart to know the Word of God, or otherwise you won't ever even be looking for it. I've said this many times. There's a lot of people in the world today got religion, but they do not have salvation. Salvation puts you in tune with God. And you're hungry for something other that he might feed you to sustain you along your walk of life. Now, brothers and sisters, isn't it not strange that he puts this event, for wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Well, who are these eagles? They are the foolish, I mean, the wise virgin that you read in verse uh, chapter 25. Because when that shout came forth as the Apostle Paul spoke that it would, that wakes up the age of Laodicea. When I look back in the 50s, brothers and sisters, there was a move of God begin to hit America. Here goes Billy Graham. His testimony, he wanted to be the greatest evangelist the world ever had. He got that title. But the last 20 some years of his life was a compromise. He began to compromise the things that he preached to the multitudes. That's why when he was in Louisville a year ago, you had rock singers singing in his meetings. Young people, let me tell you this. There's no place in the kingdom of God for rock singers. Hell's where they belong. Well, I don't like that, Brother Jackson. I don't care if you don't like it. I remember when the rotten stuff started. And I never heard nobody saying of God yet shout hallelujah. I'd rather hear Roy Acuff sing. Than that bunch of stuff. At least when they wrote their songs about the gospel. It come from a sincere heart. Some of you people may not, may not realize a scientific test has been proved on it. I've read it. They played it in dairy barns. Now imagine about 15 or 20 Holstein milk cows all lined up on, on their stands with electric milkers hooked to them. And you start that rotten beat, 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 beat. They said them cows. There's something in them that makes them start growing up. But when they played classical music, like that's been written three or four, five hundred years, they relax their spirits and their muscles relaxed and they give their milk down. Young people, I'm looking right at your face. 
Rock music came out of the pit of hell. Elvis Presley was raised up in a Pentecostal church. But he could wiggle and twist and beat and rock. And could sing about in the chapel. And then he could turn right around and sing, you hound dog, you. What a mess America has become. And we set the pace for it all over the world. And I'm going to say some things tonight, young people, please listen to me. Because I'm not forcing you to listen to it. But whenever you think you're going to stand in the presence of the Lord, at the marriage supper of Jesus Christ, you'll never hear a rock music band. You'll hear that heavenly choir playing them harps of gold. And it won't be rock music. And you church of Christ, you better wake up. You say the Bible don't speak, it does. Because in the book of Revelation it speaks how that in heaven there's harps of gold. That's a lot better than the ones you can buy down here at the music stores. I say that to build my, my story here tonight. During that period of time, brothers and sisters, that verse 28 started. That's exactly where the wise servant that you read about in verse 45 is feeding who? The little eagles. What is the seventh parable of Matthew 13? Jesus likened the kingdom age of the seventh parable. That's the age you and I live in. He says, first it is like a great net cast out into the sea. The fifties brought that. Billy Graham, Oral Roberts, William Branham, A.T. A. A. Allen, Gail Jackson, Delmar Gardner, on and on and on I can name them. Up and down the highways of America went their trucks. Meetings in this city, from Evansville to Cincinnati, W.D. Grant, all of them. Then they went to Europe. That was a move of the Spirit of God for salvation that he gave this world after World War II. Had brought the world to such a dark hour of despair. Europe lay in chaos, smoldering ruins from the tip of Italy to Norway to Austria to London, England. Europe looked anything but being a healthy, prosperous civilization. I'll say this tonight. This little country called the United States. I can read it right out of here. The billions they came and stood at the White House doors and begged our Treasury Department to loan them millions and billions of dollars. And this nation and its old line of citizenry paid with tax money to start helping rebuild Europe. To get it ready for its role in Revelations 13. And that move of the Spirit started to those that was hungry and thirsting after God to do something. To help heal the wounds that people had suffered during those dark hours of World War II. When their sons went off to war, never to return. The dads and mothers that cried and wept with tears. When they got on the troop trains at the different depots. Or they met them at the seaport. Where they got on the ship and sailed never to return again. This revival was a move of God to help heal these wounds. Of these dads and mothers that had lost their long one, loved ones. That had died to fight a war. 
to end the war of imperialism. And I have to say to the leadership and the government of our nation today, you've sold it down the drain to a bunch of devils. But all that time, there's been a little bunch of eagles. We're not very well thought of. And I will say to the world, I care less. Like I've said this many times, you don't butter my bread and you don't tie my shoes. So don't try to tell me what I can preach, what I can't preach. I have seen the sufferings of people in the Orients, in the islands of the sea, when their little homes has been burnt to the ground from bombardment, and how they picked up their few belongings and threw it on a stick over their shoulder and away they went. It'd be a good thing that that kind of a condition never hit America, but it could. And I want you to know, brothers and sisters, for 30-some years, there has absolutely been a carcass. Don't look for it on the highway. You look for it wherever there's eagles gathered. And if you examine it and watch it, they're picking on something or other that's fresh revelation out of the Word of God. That's exactly where you'll find the wise virgins too. Because that 10th verse and 9th and 10th verse fits in there. That's what makes them wise, enlightened. But it's also, brothers and sisters, where that evil servant in verse 50 of the 24th chapter is thrown out. This is that kind of a guy. He likes to set dates. He likes to set times. And they've set them and set them and set them and set them. Nothing ever happened. And when they run out of anything to set, then the real eagles will be listened for that sound of that scream of that eagle. When we look over then, brothers and sisters, Father, about the talents, you know and I know, in these three verses that I've read, verse 50, verse 9 and 10 in the 25th chapter, and verse 19, in the 25th chapter, there are three specific periods of time that the Lord has come on the scene. And you know, and I know, that don't take place in heaven. It takes place down here. We're in the last 100 years, and we're moving close to the week of Daniel. With this in mind, it is true. This whole age is called the age of the five wise and the five foolish from the start, start to finish. It's when the hour comes that that shout goes forth. That's what divides it. And I can say this tonight. When I look back, brothers and sisters, of that year of 1963, I can see exactly how it has divided the religious world. Tonight they're gathered in their big TV auditoriums, in their big synagogues, and not their synagogues, but in their other cathedrals, singing and shouting hallelujah to glory to God. But they got no more understanding about the coming of Christ than my puppy dog does. You can get up in their churches and preach the coming of Christ, but when you begin to deal with something other that really is specific, that really begins to pull things out of the Scripture. Now, wait a minute, Brother Jackson. That sounds a little bit fanaticism. We didn't learn that in our seminaries. I don't care if you didn't. I didn't get this out of the cemetery either. With this in mind, let's take one more look at this foolish age of these foolish ones. There's many died. And in other parts of the world, long in this same early period here of the century, they were martyred. In 19 and 14, right here, in Russia alone, there was close to 5 million people 
that claim to be believers in Jesus Christ, executed, put to death. Later, there was 3,800 and some odd ministers of different beliefs over there. They were executed. Yes, sir. They were martyred. But in China alone, in 1949 and 50, close to 19 million were executed because of their belief in Christianity. Does that mean all foolish virgins have to be martyred? Not at all. But listen carefully. In some parts of the world, they were martyred. But thank God for America. Because this nation was founded on the principles of Jesus Christ. And the believers believe in God. I can remember when I went to school. At Borden and Henryville, a Catholic girl sat in front of me. One or two Jehovah Witness children sat in the same congregation, Methodist and Baptist, and some didn't even go to church. But if our teacher ever stood up and said, let's bow our heads and have the Lord's Prayer. Out of respect, we all bowed our heads. And nobody trotted at home telling mommy and daddy, guess what? They made me pray today. You only hear that junk now. After our institutions have been brainwashed. But not then. I say this. America was different in the 40s than it is now in the 2000s. Something's happened in the last 55 years. Now then, <clears throat> we're going to come down into the 50s. I had never heard of Brother Branham yet. Me and my wife, we've just been married about a year and a half. She had an aunt. She was a, a godly, loving Methodist woman. That's all she knew. She could have been a Baptist or Presbyterian as far as that's concerned. But was in the late spring. She took seriously ill. Put her in the car in the hospital. In a few days, her body signs just began to go away. There finally came a time when all of her body functions just ceased. The doctor said she's dead. They got ready to call the undertaker for, her, for them to come and get the body. That's the way they do. I'm telling this tonight to let you know. There's people, brothers and sisters, all through this era that there's been wise and foolish. Plumb on down into this era. They've died a natural death. And though they're referred to as foolish, they still will come up with a white robe. Keep in mind, the bride of Christ is not coming up with a white robe. They come up with white fine linen. When all of a sudden, her vital signs began to return. Her heart started beating, she started breathing, and directly she was awake. And when some of her family began to say, Mother, the first thing she began to talk, I would swear it was the beautifulest place I've ever saw. Her mother had died when she was a young girl. She had to grow up, I believe, with a small brother and a small sister. Cared for by relatives. She had never saw her mother. After then, her mother had passed away when she was young. But as she passes out of this life into heaven, she was met by her mother, who was already there in the spirit world. She began to converse with her mother. And as her mother began to tell her, I'll never forget when she then finally was, she was sent home in about two days after this. She said to me, Brother Junie, I was young then. She said, you don't want to miss it. It's the most beautiful place I've ever saw in my life. She said, my mother was telling me certain things. 
And finally, my mother was saying to me, well, now, you must get ready to go back. And she said, I said, Mommy, I don't want to go back. But her mother said, you must go back because your husband still needs you yet. The next thing she does, she's awake in her body. Now, what does that tell me? That was back here in 1950. She died a natural death. She was not murdered. How many are listening to me? And I have to say, over this world, wherever people are privileged to live their faith and belief, without coming up and being confronted with some kind of a political obstacle, to be put in jail, or to be executed or something, those that really were truly, God looked upon it as foolish virgins. What makes them foolish? It's because they did not recognize what God did back here at the start of the century. When God dropped the Holy Ghost. Now we've got a lot of church going people today. They think this thing of the supernatural and speaking in tongues and things like that's of the devil. Well then don't, don't never read about the early church. Because every scripture proves that whatever kind of a church it was that was sowed on the day of Pentecost, that's the kind of church he's going to reap when he comes for it and it's alive. You don't sow rice and get barley. You sow and you get exactly what you sowed. You've got to accept it through all the blade and the stalk growth. It's rice here, but it's rice over here multiplied. So that's what Christendom has been. In the apostolic eye, it was a supernatural church. But when, they, but when they began to be killed and died off, they began to lose out the revelation of truth. So the supernatural began to die with it. By the time we come into the third century, now, brothers and sisters, Christendom begins to go into the blade and the stock structure. And that's why when we come through the dark ages, Look at this great big old stalk of Roman Catholicism. But then, brother, here comes the Reformation. Blade number one, Calvin, I mean, Martin Luther. Then Calvin, then Knox, then John Wesley. Then right up here is the head. Here's when it's anointed with the Holy Spirit. Because that anointing sets up a message right down to that stalk. And brothers and sisters, you know what it does? It begins to call all the nutrients from that stalk from up here in the head where it's going to produce the same kind of a grain that was sowed in the ground. And that's why I say tonight, brothers and sisters, we are to be exactly like they were in the apostolic hour. Preaching the same thing. And now that don't mean that you have to wear a robe like they did or sandals like they did. But it does mean, brothers and sisters, this word of God is going to have the same effect in your heart and, my, and life as it is mine. So then, <clears throat> my wife saying, as she sat there and told me that testimony, I can't listen to somebody that wants to tell me that all them foolish virgins that died back there had nothing. Thanks. They did. Thanks. I ask you a simple question. What made them to be compared to the wise in the first place? They were a virgin. What made the wise called virgins? It's the grace of God and the blood of Jesus Christ that's cleansed them and then filled them with the Holy Ghost. But the foolish, the same blood that saved these, saved these. The same conviction that convicted these of sin, convicted these. But then when it cleansed these brothers and sisters... They didn't wait long enough to be filled with the Holy Spirit. They began to say, well, we get it all at the same time. And that's been the denominational argument down through the decades. So with that, brothers and sisters, it produced, in an hour of time, an era of the most gospel enlightened that there had been since the days of the early church. I got it in the history. John Wesley... George Whitfield and those men that followed, hardly one was dead before God raised up another. And when you read the testimony, 
the Holy Ghost and power would fall on them congregations out of the different denominations of churches that existed then. The Holy Ghost would sometimes come upon a sinner. They would come to criticize and condemn and only to be smitten by the power of God and fall on the floor and then beg for somebody to come and pray for them. That takes the power of God. It would be nice if it do some people out of way today. They need to fall on the floor. They need to beg for somebody to come and pray for me. But no, it's not that way. We come so start you nice. Like we're ready to go to a big dance somewhere. Well, brothers and sisters, the only thing I want to look at is be ready to go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And sit around that great banquet table of heaven. And I'll tell you one more testimony out of this era. We come on down into 1952. That's the year that I first met Brother Branham. I had been reading in the scriptures. I could see that that spirit of Elijah had to come again in the last days. You'll not get no denominational preacher tell you that. That's why they're still out there tonight. Going through the same rigor roll, preaching the same thing day in and day out. And they think that Jesus is coming to get them out of them system, brother and sister, and that's going to be the bride of Christ. It is not. My father-in-law was a good man. I've said this many times. He treated me like a son. Many times because we lived there side by side. Many times when I'd go to the field to plow, he'd have his tractor and be right there in the field with me plowing. Then in return, I'd take mine and go to his field, and we'd plow and be plowing side by side. We planted side by side. We cultivated, we plowed, and we did everything together. But I learned one thing, brothers and sisters. Don't be preaching to your loved ones all the time. If you want to make a mess out of things, just keep on preaching, gabbing. Me and my wife both agreed. We will never preach to our parents. We will live before them what we feel that God has done for us and leave the rest in the hand of God. After we met Brother Branham in 1952, he was having a weekend's meeting at the tabernacle. We got to take them one night at the tabernacle. They got to hear Brother Branham preach. During that same period of time, Brother Branham, that was his first time to ever come on our farm to rabbit hunt. He came down. I called my father-in-law and asked him if he wanted to come out and meet us. He did. I will say this much about Brother Branham. He was not a man that's all the time preaching to you. He could talk to you on the level that you are familiar with. And when I introduced him to my father-in-law, it wasn't long he was talking to him about his farm, what he raised and such. That's the way Brother Branham was. He was a man that was liked by everybody. He did not make anybody feel ashamed because you didn't go to church or anything like that. He made them feel welcome. But that was the beginning of my father-in-law getting acquainted with this man. When he was in the church of the open door, a few months after we first met, we didn't preach to a, her dad and mother. We just asked them, would they like to go to the meeting with us one night and see this man? They said, sure. So we take. And they got to set up close to the front with us. And they got to watch this man preach his message and how God used him in that gift of picking people out of the audience, telling them what was wrong with them and such. When we took them home, we did not ask them, well, how would you like the service? We just left it in the hand of God. Well, through the years, brothers and sisters, till we come into the 60s, he was down there at different times. My father-in-law was around him. He would like to hunt with him. But there came a time, brothers and sisters, in the 60s, my father-in-law took sick. Now, I'm bringing you on, brothers and sisters, to the last part of 66 going into 67. The doctors had x-rayed him. They couldn't find nothing wrong. They finally found out he had cancer on the left kidney. But the cancer was on the inside, the hidden part. The x-rays couldn't take it. And so he had to go into Baptist, the old Baptist hospital and was operated on. Well, we thought maybe that's going to correct his sickness and he'll get well. Well, for a few months it looked like he regained his strength. He put out a crop. 
But he got weak. He didn't get to harvest it. I had to harvest it for him. We're in the year of 67 now. And we're in the summer months. And he's getting weaker all the time. And he passed away in 67. In the month of November. But just a few days before he passed away. I'm saying these things tonight for the glory of God. Here was a man that went to church. A Methodist church. But he never made much profession. But he never aggravated me. And I didn't aggravate him. But one morning I went down to feed his cattle. It was my job to go in and give him a shot. I come in past where he was sitting. And I say this tonight, brother and sister, because it brings the name of William Branham into the picture. I started past him, and he reached up and grabbed me by the arm. He just said, Junior. And when I looked down, he was crying. He says, I'm not going to be with you much longer. I'm going to go where your daddy and Brother Branham was at. Why did he say Brother Branham? Why didn't he say something like Wigglesworth? Or somebody like that. I have to say he saw something in that man. That left a testimony in his heart. He says I'm not going to be with you much longer. I'm going to go where your daddy and brother Branham is at. Well brothers and sisters. On a Saturday of that same week. The wife and I had went to Cardin to do some shopping and come back. We stopped to see how he was doing. We come into the house. And as I walked in past him, he just reached up and he took my arm. He said, Junior, I saw something a while ago. It was the most beautiful scene I ever saw. My father-in-law was a man that liked children. If somebody would come there with four or five children, I've seen him stop cutting hay, go get the tractor, hook up the wagon, put all the kids on it, and out across the field he'd go. That's just the way he liked to do things for children. He said, I looked out that door, and he said, I saw the most beautiful field full of flowers. And in the distance I saw two children come walking and they were so happy and I kept watching them and in my heart junior I said if they come to me I'm going home with them this is the last time he ever talked that way because the next day he started getting worse we had to take him then to St. Anthony's Hospital and I went in there late at one evening to shave him. You can see he was getting weaker. And we left there, and when we just got home and got in the house, the telephone rung, and my wife's mother was still at the hospital. She said, Junior, John just passed away. Now I'm looking right at you. That man left this world. He never knew not much about serving the Lord when he did go to the Methodist church. But when he met that little man, just those few times to be around him and to hear what he said left a profound testimony in his heart. And here just before he breathes his last breath, I was privileged to hear his own words say, I am going where Brother Branham is at. Now I have to say this, he was not martyred. Neither was he executed. How many are listening to me? He died a natural death. But he died knowing the Lord. No, he did not live long enough for the Lord one day and to be in fine linen. How many understands that?
but he is going to be raised in that red line where they have white robes. Now, it's important that we see that red line. That's not fine linen. The blue, blue, blue line, it starts here at Pentecost, comes right down, and here it's raptured. Just about the time the week starts. That takes the blue line out of here. Now go with me tonight to Revelations 19. Remember, I said this morning... The bride of Christ is not clothed in white robes. She's clothed in fine linen. Well, linen is white, I know it. But so is cotton white. But the priest in Israel, they wore linen garments. Don't forget it. And the holy of holy place, that was curtained off. Read it in Exodus 19. That was curtained off by fine linen curtains. That is looked upon as the most valuable material there is. In the 19th chapter of Revelations, the 7th verse, where did John see these? He saw them in heaven, not down here on earth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife, that's his true church bride, hath is a past tense word, hath made herself ready. Where? Not in heaven. Down here. Up to that point. Because those that make that group up We'll receive everything, we'll hear everything that is related to them getting ready for that translation. I say this tonight. You could, I could preach this to the denominational church and then run me off. I'm glad there ain't nobody else in started that yet in here. There's a difference between the bride of Christ and a bunch of foolish virgins or tares. I hate to say it that way. This is the age when all tares are going to be separated from where God's primary purpose is at. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Didn't say a thing about it. And they washed them and made them white, did it? And he says unto me, right blessed are they which are called into the marriage. Now the marriage is not going to take place down here. That marriage. Because that's where the supper's at. Down here, brothers and sisters, in the 25th chapter, and the 9th and 10th verse, and the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went into the marriage. Read it. But they went first into a revelation. Here's where we get clothed. Here's where we get our understanding made right. And we'll find out whether we got religion or salvation. A lot of us have been wearing old religious rags. Leaving the woodshed. And let's put on fine linen. It's the most beautiful material there is in the category of God. These are the two things of God. Now this verse is what I'm coming to you for. And I fell at his feet. This is an angelic being. To worship him. And he says unto me, See thou do it not. For I am thy fellow servant. And of thy brethren. Now brothers and sisters, let me say this. There was a lot of people when Brother Branham was alive. Well, this is William Branham. Brothers and sisters, notice what it said. 
I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus Christ. God took his man. But he didn't take his angelic being. Don't tell me that the angels that God made only have one purpose. And I have to say, brothers and sisters, when God takes his man, that angel can move over and use something else. And I have to say, these angelic beings, beings have been used and used and used and used through the centuries of time. Now that brings me to this point. Because if the righteous angels sent forth by God, to them that shall be heirs of salvation, then there are evil angels, evil spirits, Amen. that play around out there in the people of the world. And that's why some of them get all kinds of crazy revelations. Such as reincarnation. There is no such thing. But I'll tell you what it is. Angelic beings that are fallen angels can play around out there in the worldly crowd. And when they see that mind that's not dedicated to nothing, they can come on and inspire that mind. And after a while you'll hear them say, Oh, I believe in reincarnation. Sure. And they can tell you where grandma's pocketbook's at. That might sound like a joke. But they can do it. Because that miserable angel knows where it's at. They made a movie years ago on General Patton when he was in North Africa. I saw it. George Patton believed in reincarnation. Little did he realize... That the same angelic being that no doubt had led an ancient king in a battle in North Africa to take a certain place. I remember when Pat got in his jeep and he told his driver, down the road, that's the way he walked, I meant went. But it came to a place where there was a grove, grove, grove of trees. He said, driver, off here, right to the trees, off. The jeep went right out through the grass and finally they came to a hilly area. And there is the ruins of an old city in North Africa. Pat gets out of his tank, I mean out of his jeep, and walked around. And he began to tell his driver just exactly what king and his army that had destroyed that city told the tactics and everything. And when I heard that, yes, George, you got that same angel that guided that fellow too. How many heard what I said? <clears throat> I don't believe in reincarnation. But I do believe in there's an anointing. Now with that in mind, I want to finish up this verse. Right of Christ... Are we the bride of Christ? Do we believe that we are those people that wants to make up this people? Because this book of Revelation was written for you. Every bit of it. It wasn't written for the religious world. If it was written for the religious world, they would be preaching out of it tonight and they'd have the truth of it. They would. Listen to this. When this angelic being tells John, you don't worship angels. He said, I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Amen. Hallelujah. I like this. But... There is a Christian people on earth today that God has dealt with in a spiritual, prophetic way. They're living in a time when prophecy has been fulfilled before your very eyes. It's our bread. It's our enlightenment. It helps us to see our hour. It helps us to know who we are. Jesus is coming soon. I'm sick and tired of being a good Methodist or a Baptist or a Presbyterian or this or that. I want to be a child of God. I want to be fed out of this book. From somebody who knows what they're talking about. The testimony. 
You never heard, brothers and sisters, anybody in the denominational world that could say the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy for them. It's not. It's only for those in the end time who are living in them. And I have to say, brothers and sisters, that carcass that we come to is a continual revelation and a flowing of the Word of God right down to the earthly recipients who is ordained to hear it. They feast upon it. And every bit of it puts them in a time frame. It's prophetic. That's why, brothers and sisters, you don't take this back into the epistles. It's not even there. The book of Revelation was not written for the denominational world. Everything they preach out of it is a dead letter. How many times have I heard these doctors of divinity say, Well, the Antichrist will make a covenant with Israel for one week so the Jews can build the temple. That's not even what the Bible says. You know that. <clears throat> so with this in mind, I want to say this tonight. All of these people clothed in white in the 19th chapter that left this earth where this blue line ends and they sent into heaven. They are clothed in fine linen. They're the righteous bride of Christ. They go to the marriage feast supper. Now listen. But the rest of these foolish virgins, may I say this, they will be a foolish virgin by the time they hit this line. There will be no more Gentiles become foolish virgins in this period. How many heard what I said? Because when he stops dealing with the Gentiles here where he finishes his bride church, then he goes to the Jew. So the foolish virgin will already been saved. And they just missed the rapture. So they're headed for this hour of time. With that in mind, <clears throat> I want you to go with me now to Revelation, the 12th chapter. I'm not getting loud because I'm mad. I just want to absolutely get my point made over. I don't want to become angry and mean and mad at people. That's not the purpose. But I've heard so many of these doctors of divinity preach. Oh, I tell you, they get up there and man, they got a vocabulary of verbal, audible words, so intellectual. Some people just sat there with their mouth. He's a wonderful speaker. And after the first 45 minutes, you've heard a lot of wonderful, ecclesiastical, educated words. But you go out of there not knowing a bit more than you did when you come. You just heard a nice man that knew how to put his words together. I don't say that to be little people. God didn't necessarily call that kind of a man to be a minister to the bride of Christ. That's why, brothers and sisters, though Paul himself was an intellectual man of his hour, when God got a hold of him and changed him, his testimony was, he laid it all aside that he might have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And God gave him a revelation. He knew how to preach it. When we come to the 12th chapter, here's where that starts. It's the seventh chapter that was on this morning where John saw the, the angel coming from the east with the everlasting gospel. He saw the two prophets then come on the scene. They're the earthly messengers to Israel. And they're going to preach 1,203 score days, three and a half years of that. And in that period of time, brothers and sisters, there's going to be 144,000 men. Right. Not women. Amen. They're servants. They're going to be sealed with the Holy Ghost. But at the same time, 
There is another element of that society in Israel. It's referred to here as the woman. Because they heard the two prophets too. They are old men, old women, young men, young women, boys and girls, all of the society. They heard exactly what them two prophets said. But they heard them prophets say that there'll come a time when the Antichrist will come here and kill us. When you see this coming about, you in here, get out of here, flee. Now when we see then, brothers and sisters, that the 144,000 are sealed, John then saw this great multitude. Notice they were standing before the throne, not under the altar as the fifth seal was. And it says, they have washed their robes and made them white. It was not fine linen. Call it whatever you will, but it's just white robes. And they had to wash every one of them. And brothers and sisters, they came out of every generation, every nation, every tongue, and such. From the beginning of the gospel era, till we reach this period of time right here. So I'm saying this. The gospel was primarily to get a bride. But at the same time, there was the counterpart. Them that would fall into this red line. That would wind up having white robes. And as the bride fill, fills this line, then the other line fills this line. It's not until we get down here in this age that these that are, are in this era of time, they fill this line. They're called foolish virgins. But all of them, brothers and sisters, that's their spirits up there. That's not the bride. That's people with white robes waiting to be resurrected. How many catch the point? Preachers have preached this, that this is the bride waiting to be resurrected. She can't be in one scene with a white robe and another one in fine linen. That's contradictory to the scriptures. So we could say this. At the same time, he was getting a white people ro with robes that would be fine linen. Those people might have been martyred, but they were allowed to live long enough that they became knowledgeable. They grew. They developed a fruitful life. And their deeds and everything accompanied them. That kind of people would not just be martyred three days later. How many understand me now? But these others, they hit this other category. And I will have to say, at the same time, martyrdom, persecution, as I've read it in history, many of your bride saints was absolutely fed to the lions. But there was other younger ones fed to the lions at the same time. They were not brides. They were the white robed ones. So keep in mind, the bride... And the great multitude, they all come out of the same respective generations of time, but they fall in two different categories. How many understand my point? That shouldn't be confusing. Because there'll be people in the bride, brothers and sisters, that when they come over here, and it's the bride that's going to judge the world, they're going to get to see their counterpart come up in the resurrection. Now when we come then to the 12th chapter, this is where the Antichrist then comes in. In the middle of the week, he kills the prophets. Once the two prophets are killed, they lay in the streets for three days and a half. Brothers and sisters, that's a sign for the woman to go to get to running. But you'd also know this, that in the 14th chapter of Revelation, John sees these 144,000 standing on the Mount Zion, and the Lamb standing with them. That only signifies... That that 144,000, having been filled with the Lamb Spirit, the Holy Ghost, they will know exactly where to go and preach the everlasting gospel. It's not a gospel of salvation. Forget that. It's a gospel, brothers and sisters, for this remaining period of time to the nations of the world. And you can read it in the 14th chapter. Number one, 
Fear God. Worship Him that created the heavens and earth. Right at the time, brothers and sisters, when this whole stinking world of politics is trying to brainwash and get it out of the, mount, the minds of our youth. God sent an earthquake and shake them up. I say it with respect that every time I hear a professor, a journalist, a politician, or a philosopher give his views about the problem in the Middle East, it's disgusting. They might be educated, but they're educated on the basis of carnality. Don't mention a thing about God. Well, I have to come along and say, take this whole world, but give me Jesus. Because I'm coming back with him one of these days. <laughs> and if you're in the bride of Christ, you are too. Because those that are in the bride of Christ, that's her revelation. And she's going to know exactly where she fits into the total prophetic picture. So then, brothers and sisters, while the bride's in glory, the foolish virgins that are left here, they go through this period, they'll hear the same thing that the Jews will hear. But, oh, it's when we come here. That dirty Antichrist, he breaks his covenant with Israel. And the 144,000 they break to go to the world. They're going to warn this world out against atheism. Worship him. Bring God back on the scene. Then they're going to warn the world about the mark of the beast and so forth. And then they're going to warn the world about the Roman Catholic system. And do you know something, brothers and sisters, tonight? In the last few months, what have you heard? From Texas to New York, from border to border, Catholic priests in America are being exposed for their pulpit using to become sex perverts with young boys in their congregations. Little does our modern society realize this just didn't happen 40 or 50 years ago. This has been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. From Europe to Latin America, these priests who have preached celibacy, the Apostle Paul never taught such stuff. That's a perversion and a twisting of the Scriptures. And to prove to you, brothers and sisters, tonight, that 144,000 is really going to expose how false that system is in that hour. And I have to say, in America now, God's done knocking on the door. It's the priesthood now, but then it's going to be the system. Therefore, that 144,000 will preach the, it's the last gospel this world will ever hear. It's the good news. Come back to God. Forsake the world. The systems. Because it's God's way in the heart of young people. Warning them. Telling them. This world is not going to last another century or a generation of time. Let me say this tonight very carefully. It's nothing to walk down a street. <clears throat> now, I'm not a person that's going to walk down the street and I've got to look at that going there. I don't do that. Because I can see enough just walking at it. So when I pass it, I'm going to walk right on, Bob. But I remember what I saw walking toward it. Here comes a nice looking young girl, healthy looking. She's been tattooed from ankles, all the way up her legs, round her arms, round her neck. I wouldn't marry that if you give me a train load of it. I wouldn't want it in my house. 
I want a woman. Not a has been, sent for, couldn't go. That's what we used to say in the army. I have read some of the most ridiculous things that's went on in some of these rock and roll camps. It's ridiculous. It's a shame. Fifty, sixty years ago, it would never happen. But after they started this rotten stuff they teach in schools now, then out of hell these spirits came. And they clum right up through the curriculum of our intellectual systems today. And it goes right back to that track I've told you many times about that I saw on the troop train coming home in December, or January 1946 from the war. A communist track. How we will destroy America from within. First we'll get into your institutions and we will demoralize your young people. Second, we will get in there and we will set the races against one another. We will divide the nation's political systems. Then we will attack the American home. And then we will have brought America to her hour. And you're living in it tonight. They don't want men like me no more to preach. No. If you keep on preaching like that, you won't have a crowd. I'm not looking for a crowd. I'm just looking for the ones that God has called. So I have to say, little eagles, <laughs> there's a carcass being prepared. <laughs> we're not going to poke it down your throat. No, but we're going to cut it in little pieces where you can swallow it and understand what he really what it is. Because eagles ain't like hogs. I have fed hogs when they all try to get their trough at the same time. And they never say grace either. <laughs> but God's little eagles, they're patient, they wait on one another. Hallelujah. Now let us watch this 144,000. I've been asked before, Brother Jackson, is he 144,000 killed? Nope. Well, why not? Because nowhere in the Word says they are. Keep in mind, brothers and sisters, though certain things sound like all, everywhere, this or that, keep in mind, God's got a certain thing and a certain way He advocates certain things to be brought about. So while, brothers and sisters, 144,000, and I will say this, whatever nation these immigrant Jews, these young men, it's called them, brothers and sisters, in the 14th chapter, virgins. Does that mean they're not married? It has nothing to do with that. It means they have not been proselyted by these denominations. God has done this by His own leadership of His Spirit. So they preach and warn the world. And I'll say this. Thousands of young people throughout the world even that are in college. By the time that week of Daniel goes forth and they hear what God does in the Middle East, don't tell me there's going to be a lot of young people think different than they think tonight. They're going to begin to think there's got to be something to this that there is a God. And I'm not going to keep on believing in this junk and stuff. Why? All because, brothers and sisters, out of this hour of time we live in, there's going to be some young people pass through this by the divine grace of God. And they're going to come out over here on the other side because they're going to make up the nations that he comes to rule and reign over. Dope addicts. All they know is to make a living by stealing. They've done had their brain damaged. Young people, you don't need a spell. You don't need a high like that. You need an experience with the Holy Ghost. And I'll tell you, He'll give you a spell. 
And when you're in it, brothers and sisters, you'll say, Lord, I've never felt like this before. Lord, if I could die like this, just take me on home to glory. But when you come out of it, you'll still have your equilibrium, you'll have your brains, and all your physical faculties in order. Now then, I realize this. This puts the woman. Now I come to Brother Abraham. How many times I've heard it said. I heard it said myself. One place when he would turn to the 12th chapter. And John saw this other great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun. And the moon under her feet. And upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And she being with child cried travailing in birth. And pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold a great red dragon. Having seven heads and ten horns. And seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. And did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before. The woman. Which was ready to be. Delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man child. How many times I've heard Brother Branham say. That's the bride crowned with the gospel of the twelve apostles. That's one statement. But then another time. He said that's Israel fleeing for her life. Saints, it can't be both. Because the church I belong to ain't going to have to flee to the wilderness. You listening to me? I said the church I belong to ain't having to go to the wilderness. That's why they're after for the church. But this woman that is prepared here, she's given two wings of an eagle. It's the message of the two prophets that equip her. And she knows exactly where to go. So therefore, this is the picture of Israel in her first advent up to verse 5 that covers her beginning and brings it to the era of the advent and birth of Christ. And then, brothers and sisters, they were after him and they crucified him and then he was caught up unto God in the resurrection. And there's where she's been. Between verse 5 and verse 6 is the grace age that you and all and I live in. Now then, verse 6 brings it right back to the 20th century Jews. Here's where they're gathered to hear the message of these two prophets. And out of this generation, brothers and sisters, of Jews that will hear them, there's going to be this whole multitude that make up the total woman. They receive their messages and they've got to go flee. Why, Brother Jackson? All because the dirty Antichrist is going to try to exterminate and annihilate the Jewish race. Why? Because they was the ones that God gave his holy word through to start with. The devil don't like it. That's exactly why, brothers and sisters, it was said to those under the altar when they were given white robes. And it was said, rest a little while until your fellow brethren and so forth is slain as you are. And that's where, brothers and sisters, it comes out over here. Let me bring this into, into a time factor here <clears throat> to show you. Once this woman is in this 12th chapter, in the latter part where she flees, we come to verse 11. Those, because brothers and sisters... Here's the foolish virgin that goes through here. Here's the Jews that got their enlightenment here. And now then they're going through this period. But the devil is asked them, after them. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Who's that? You Gentile foolish virgins. And by the word of the testimony. That's the Jew. And they love not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Would... To the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has but a short time. And I have to say, this week, brothers and sisters, is going to be brought into this world not too long in front of us. 
political, domestic problems is going to necessitate it. Now let us look at the Wall Street. I don't study the Wall Street. But you know, brothers and sisters, we have 260 some million people in America. And right now, brothers and sisters, Wall Street has hit a low. I heard it said the other day, how many years now? It's the lowest it's ever been. Keep in mind, when the Wall Street here does reach a low, and it can't never seem to rise out of it, this begins to shake the overall economic systems throughout the whole world. With all the domestic problems of the political picture and the economic problems, this throws an element of people in the world itself who've lived so long after the money and the material things they cannot claim. They're going to start screaming. How long are you going to keep this up? So the devil, brothers and sisters, is going to be absolutely turned loose within a carnal realm of human domestic people. And they're going to put together some kind of a system that's going to guarantee security, monetary-wise. It's not security. It's just a fake thing, brothers and sisters. With all the other things that's going to be going on in the Middle East, carnal man is going to use carnal means to try to put together an era of false prosperity, of peace, tranquility, and so on and so forth. Because that's all the carnal man of the earth looks for. And America, for the last, I'll say, is the 25 or 30 years, they lived the highest they've ever lived. We've got an element of society, brothers and sisters, in America, that's all really they think about. Security, monetary-wise. We've got a standard of living, brothers and sisters, that far exceeds everybody else's. We've lived that way so long, we think that it's supposed to go on like this forever and ever. I have to say, God has allowed America to have such a prosperity. But when we lose sight of God and begin to trust in that monetary thing, then this lets me know, God knows exactly how to take it out of your hand. And don't tell me, brothers and sisters, that the dirty devil can't put together a false spirit in front of us to help stabilize this shaking, carnal minds of the world. With that in mind, brothers and sisters, that's why this woman has to be prepared. So when she's turned loose, now I'm not going to tell you where she's coming to. I'm saving that for my next message. But I want to show you how the Word agrees with every scripture. To show you the devil's going after them foolish virgins. And he's going after every Jew he can get his hands on. And he's going to get his hands on a lot of Jews. But this woman, Jew people that was in the land and heard the prophets, they know there's a place in this earth that they're going to flee to. Now listen carefully. The assemblies of God and all of them say, it's the ancient city of Petra. Well, I've been there twice. And tell you, I'd rather be down home in Harrison County <laughs> than over there. Because from Jerusalem, it's only about 80 miles away the crow flies. Brother Mott, we could take about a half a dozen helicopters over there and blow them all to pieces. So don't tell me that so many hundred thousand Jews are going to flee to Petra. When the end of Christ is going to be in Jerusalem with his army. But he ain't going to bring no helicopters. He ain't going to bring no jet airplanes. Hogwash. That Antichrist is going to have all the modern up-to-date weaponry right there that he needs. So you have to understand, she's going to flee somewhere, they can't get to her. Listen to the 17th verse. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Notice this now. 
which keep the commandments of God, that's those Jews, and have the testimony of Jesus. That's the foolish virgins. They won't give up for nothing. That's followed that over into the 14th chapter, where the 144,000 have done bid preaching, and we're coming towards the end of that period. And I'm looking here in the 12th verse. Through the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word of the Lord be established. Here is the patience of the saints. Meeting in this period of time, as we begin to come over here. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. That's the Jew. And the faith of Jesus. That's you foolish virgins. Now then. Here's another group. In the 15th chapter. It's all over. There's a reason why we see this group. In the 15th chapter. In the second verse. And I saw as it were a sea of glass. Notice where they're at. I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over his number of his name, they stood on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. Oh, oh, Church of Christ. You don't want to go there? You ain't got no harps to take with you, have you? <laughs> Notice now who they are. And they sing the song of Moses. Well, that's a Jew. He's the only one who knows it. The servant of God and the song of the Lamb. Praise God. If that don't tell you who they are. So that proves, brothers and sisters, it's the foolish virgin here. It's the Jews that have been enlightened here. Here they go into here. And the devil's after them. Well, now, brothers and sisters, the 144,000 go preaching. By the time they go over here, during this period of time, here is where the patience of the saints is really brought to test. And then it's all over. And there they stood. Sea of glass before the throne and under the altar. So, brothers and sisters, <clears throat> I'm not done. And I'm going to let you go home tonight. <clears throat> May the Lord bless you. Heavenly Father, I pray tonight. I thank you for your grace and mercy that's brought me down through life, Lord, this far. Lord, take every heart that's in here. Put together a picture for them to see and understand. Let them see you, Lord, and not me. Let them see you in your word, using it to speak to their hearts and souls. We realize tonight, Lord, we're living in the closing days of time. And I thank you tonight, Lord, for the grace and mercy of you bestowed in my life. And the people that you have allowed me to meet in my earthly journey. Lord, I thank you, and I pray now in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. May the Lord bless every one of you, brothers and sisters. <clears throat>